Well, I want to say a special welcome to uh, my family and friends up in Turner, Montana. And I appreciate Doug Dury, the preacher here in Ord, who's uh, gracious enough to come in and help me record. And I just want you to know the only notification I have on my phone is when it starts raining in Turner. So I've been praying for rain. I've been praying that the crops will be great. Uh, Doug was giving me a bad time about wearing a Cornhusker shirt. I was just reminded that when Susie and I first started dating, and then when we first were married, they would talk about how a farmer in Nebraska would rather lose a corn crop than a football game. And then they talked about Tom Osborne, who was the coach at the time. The reason he ate Cheerios on a plate is every time he gave him a bowl, he would lose it. However, we have fallen on tough times now, so we're just praying we get into a bowl game. Good thing for me, we still have the Bobcats to pray for. You probably heard that story about the individual who is about my age. He wanted to parachute out of a plane. First time he'd ever thought about it, but he thought, you know what? I'm getting older. If I don't do it quickly, soon, it's never going to happen. So the instructor said, it's really pretty simple. You jump out of the plane, you pull the rip cord. If that doesn't work, you then pull the second one. All you got to do is just count to three, pull the rip cord. He jumps out of the plane, counts to three, pulls the rip cord, nothing happens. He immediately pulls the second one, nothing happens. He gets about, oh, 150 feet from the ground, and he's going down. He meets a guy going up, and the guy going down says, do you know anything about opening parachutes? Guy going up says, no, but do you know anything about lighting a gas stove? Well, sometimes all you got to do is just kind of get to know really what you need to do. Uh, you know, one of the things that I missed during COVID was actually going to a movie theater and watching a blockbuster. We went two years without it. And finally, this summer arrived, and the number one movie that came out, fully anticipated, was the movie Top Gun. I got to admit to you, when I went to the movie, Susie and I uh, had a date night. I was super nervous. My expectations were high. I'm thinking to myself, there's no possible way that this movie can meet and live up to the expectations of the first movie. And on our, I forget that night that Susie and I were there. The music starts to play. The movie was beginning. And it was just that anticipation of the soundtrack of the movie Top Gun. Prior to going to the movie, I read the reviews off of uh, Focus on the Family. I read it out loud to Suzette. Said The reviewer said one thing after the movie, I can guarantee you will drive faster going home. Susie looked at me and said, not likely. You always drive fast. I'm not sure what she meant by that, but I do know that I've met some of the nicest highway patrolmen across the country who have written me handwritten notes. If you remember the premise of the movie, it's the best of the best. Young men and young women who are coming in, and in the previews, uh, the young lady says, we know we're going to be the best, but who in the world is going to train us? And you know this moral or the, the point of the story. There's a young man. He's no longer young, but his name is Maverick, and he lives up to his name. I looked up the definition of Maverick. One, it's a lone, unbranded calf or steer. B, it's a lone dissenter as an intellectual, an artist, a politician who takes an independent stand apart from his or her associates. And then number three, a person pursuing rebellious, even potentially disruptive policies or ideas. Obviously, Maverick lived up to that in the movie. But the man I want to take a look at today meets at least one of those definitions. It's the guy Daniel. He overlaps with Jeremiah. And if you have your Bibles with you this morning, I want to take you to Daniel chapter 1. And I just want to start reading to begin with. It says, In the third year of the reign of Jehoiakim, king of Judah, Nebuchadnezzar, king of Babylon, came to Jerusalem and besieged it. I actually want to stop right there. You know, it's so easy for you and me when we read through some of these Old Testament stories. We've heard them so often that we can skip over uh, pretty key elements. And I just want to remind you of the word besieged. I, I want you to imagine that you're in Turner. 
And you receive word that one of the most powerful armies is arriving at the top of Powell Hill. And they're bringing everything in, the catapults and the battering rams. And you've got a wall that surrounds Turner. And then they come and pretty soon they begin to besiege the city. There's an army that's waiting you out. They're going to make sure that no food gets into you. They may even stop at the Hutterite colony or at PJ and Trish's and poison the water that they know is going to go into the, the aquifer underneath Turner. And then they come in and they butcher people. They take you away to a foreign land. Daniel is probably about age 15 at this point. Verse 2, it says, And the Lord Je delivered Jehoiakim, king of Judah, into his hands, along with some of the articles from the temple of God. These were to be carried off to the temple of his God in Babylon and put in the treasury house of the God. Once again, I, I just want to remind you that when the temple was overtaken, it was ransacked, they would have taken some of the Jewish relics out of the temple and placed them in a pagan temple. And then verses 3 through 7. Then the king ordered Ashpenaz, king of the high courts, to bring in some of the Israelites from the royal family and the nobility. Young men without any physical defect, handsome, showing aptitude for every kind of learning, well-informed, quick to understand, and qualified to serve in the king's palace. He was to teach them the language of the literature of the Babylonians. The king assigned them a daily amount of food and wine from the king's table. They were to be trained for three years, and after that, they would enter into the king's servants. Among these were some from Judah, Daniel, Hananiah, Mishael, Azariah. The chief official gave them new names. To Daniel, he named Belteshazzar. To Hananiah, Shadrach. To Mishael, Meshach. And Azariah, Abednego. These guys were hand-picked. They were the cream of the crop. They were invited to attend kind of a top gun type of school. While most of their friends were slaughtered, they get to live. Others were taken away into slavery. They literally were in the king's palace. But I want you to note that they lost a lot. They lost their family. They lost their home. They lost their name. A lot to endure at any time but especially when you're a 15-year-old. Quite possible, but we don't know for certain. But most of the scholars are in agreement that probably these men were made into eunuchs. Lost any hope of having any relationship with a wife. Lost all hope of ever having children of their own. They know who's in charge. You might think, well, if they're at this point, they're going to do their best to keep their heads low. They're going to do their best just to take the training, become counselors for the king. But then look in verse 8. But Daniel resolved not to defile himself with the royal food and wine. And he asked that the chief official for permission not to defile himself in this way. I want you, if you're in the habit of underlining things in your Bible, just underline the word resolved. Daniel at this point shows that he's a maverick. He's a rebel. Daniel is a good young Jewish man. Leviticus 11.44 says, I'm the Lord your God. Consecrate yourselves and be holy because I am holy. Daniel knew that he was going to be set apart and he wanted to be holy and righteous. Daniel was going to be a walking, talking parable of God's holiness. If you study the life of Daniel, and you can find no major flaw in the life of Daniel, he's all, he always had his eye on God's holiness. And once again, you and I have to read a little bit into the story. <clears throat> Most often the food and the wine was used in pagan rituals, so it would be a double whammy. It was used in a ceremony for pagan gods. So here's Daniel. Instead of complying and going with the flow, he rebels. And maybe the answer is in his name, Daniel. Because his name means my judge is God. He said no to popular opinion. 
Daniel knew he wanted to honor the one true king. He is crystal clear. He's going to serve one God. The decision was simple. Not easy. But it was simple. And then if you go on to read in the story, Daniel and his friends, they come to the chief cupbearer and they say, we just want to separate ourselves. We don't want to eat at the king's table. We want to give, you give us an opportunity and we will prove to you that our king, our God is king of kings. And at the end of the experiment, he came in. He saw that Daniel and his friends were fatter in the flesh. And if you remember the story, they decided that they were going to be vegetarians. And this is the story where oftentimes Christians engage in what I call the adventure and missing the point. You see, one of the traps that we oftentimes run into is we see a descriptive story and we make it a prescriptive story. This is a story of a miraculous event, not a dietary prescription. If you want to be a vegetarian, that's great, but don't use this as a proof text. You see, back in the days of Daniel, back in the days in the Old Testament, young men were typically lean. Food was hard to come by. They walked everywhere. They did a lot of hard work. And yet when they came to the end of the experiment, Daniel and his friends were fatter than all the others. The point here, God is intervening. You begin to see the work of God. Second trap we always fall into, or quite often we fall into, we begin to think if we just follow God, everything will turn out in my favor. If I just follow God, I'm going to be fat and happy the rest of my life. Now, Daniel's true north was following God. But Daniel wasn't made holy because he refused to eat the king's food. Oh, Daniel was part of the top gun class. He was the cream of the crop. But don't let us forget that Daniel was a sinner. He fell short of God's perfect standard. And there's a great temptation. We think that outward performance will save us. We think if I can just hunker down and follow God to a T, you and I would call that legalism. Legalism is a belief that you can gain God's love and approval through your outward performance. And unfortunately, when you're on the road of legalism, there's two ditches. And over time, you and I will fall into both. One, there's intense depression. Because if you're trying to be saved by your good works, pretty soon you realize, I can't live up to this. And the second part, second ditch is pride. And if we're not careful, we begin to believe our own Facebook posts. You know what that's like. We post things on Facebook because we want everyone to think that our life is better than it really is. We want everybody to think that we are better than we really are. And that leads us to self-righteousness. And legalism puts us there. Jesus had some strong words in Matthew 23. He said, Woe to you, teachers of the law and the Pharisees, you hypocrites. You are like whitewashed tombs, which look beautiful on the outside, but on the inside are full of the bones of the dead and everything unclean. In the same way, on the outside, you appear to people as righteous, but on the inside, you're full of hypocrisy and wickedness. I think one of my favorite definitions of pride is it's like body odor. Everybody else knows you have it, but you don't. You see, Daniel was made holy the same way you and I are made holy. By grace through faith. For Daniel, it was faith in Yahweh God. For you and me, it's faith in King Jesus. You see, even in the Old Testament, they're looking forward to someone who would be the fulfillment of the promise made to Abraham. And you and I know it was Jesus. The Old Testament says someone is coming. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John say someone is here. And the book of Acts says someone is coming again. And you and I know that someone to be Jesus. You see, Daniel paved the way for Jesus, not only through his prophetic writings, but also through his life. 
we, we dare not forget that Daniel lived a holy and pure life and he was in a corrupt society. But he lived like an arrow pointing people to Jesus. He lived like his life like an arrow pointing to someone who was totally pure. Daniel's faith was in the promise of someone who would be coming. Oh, he didn't know his name. But you and I do. You see, all of us, Old Testament, New Testament, we have something in common. The Old Testament, they're looking forward to someone who would do and what he would do. In the New Testament, you and I look at what he has done. So how do you and I live in this corrupt and evil society? How do you and I be a maverick like Daniel? Romans chapter 12, verses 1 and 2. Therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercies, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. Do not conform to the pattern of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. Then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, His good and pleasing and perfect will. You know, just like Daniel, we cannot live like everyone else. We have been called to a radical transformation. We can either be conformed to the world or we can transform the world. To be conformed means that the culture has the prevailing winds and we follow that. It's kind of a mindless way of living, an empty, mindless way. But if you and I are transformed... We live beyond our culture. You and I need to keep in view that history is not our judge. Our judge is the judge of history. It's like Daniel's name, my judge is God. It will play out in all reality. Susie just recently bought me a book. The author is Lucas Miles. And Lucas Miles reminds us, like Daniel, the church should never call for removal, destruction, exemption, or replacement of the Word of God. We shouldn't do that in our own personal lives or in the people of this nation and around the world. Uh, Susie and I have some really good friends who live in St. Louis. Uh, he was the former CEO of a group of hospitals. He went to the nuns and he said, I want you to put scriptures and religious writings and paintings in each of the rooms. We want to get this thing back to its original roots. And they loved him. But after about the third board meeting, he found out the board was not happy. And even though the hospital roots were clearly Christian, board members made the motion to remove Jesus from the mission statement. David said, I would hate to be the guy to make the motion to remove Jesus from the mission statement. As he was telling me this story, he smiled and said, you know, he was the first one to die. If you ever wonder, in the political arena, should we be for it or against it? I think any time it removes God, then you and I as Christians need to take a stand. In 1947, a former Klansman by the name of Hugo Black reintroduced the phrase separation of church and state. In 1954, Lyndon Johnson introduced the Johnson Amendment prohibiting all 501c3 nonprofit organizations from endorsing political candidates. In 1962, the founder of the American Atheist, Madeleine Murray O'Hara, filed a lawsuit challenging the reading of the Bible and prayer in public school. In 1973, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of Jane. Roe providing a framework for legalized abortion. Fortunately, the Supreme Court has overturned that law. Keep in mind, it simply returns the decision to the states. And by the way, if you're wondering how I navigate life, and I'm talking to certain political or individuals running for political office, I ask them what their stand is on life. Because you can take this to the bank. If they're willing to take innocent life, they will not hesitate to take your liberty. In 2008, a major political party in our nation removed the name of God from all platform documents. 
In 2015, the Supreme Court ruled in favor of same-sex marriage nationwide. Four years ago, a school board, first time it was proposed, if a boy wanted to identify as a girl, he could go into a girl's restroom. It was proposed by a school board member in Fort Worth, Texas. It passed. The person who proposed this vote got 10,089 votes in the election. How in the world did he get elected in a district with 93,000 students? How did he get put on the school board when in a district that had 800,000 residents? How did he end up doing that, making such an altering decision when there was one church within blocks that had 35,000 members? Why was this allowed? I think it's because we've disengaged. We have to keep in mind that our founding fathers put in place that Congress should make no law establishing religion or prohibiting the free exercise thereof. You see, the church has sanctions under the Constitution. We have protection. And never has a church in the history of our country lost its status for taking a stand. Never. In fact, if someone comes up to you and says, I think you're violating the law, I'm afraid you're going to lose your tax-exempt status, I just want to encourage you to look them in the eye, smile, say thanks. Would you mind giving me an example? You'll never hear from them again. Because if a church has been engaged in political activity, it's never once happened in the history of our nation where they have lost their tax-exempt status. When President Lincoln took a stand to free the slaves, there was controversy on both sides. He had friends pulling him from every angle. He was quoted as saying shortly before he died, Sir, my concern is not whether God is on our side, my great concern is to be on God's side, for God is always right. Transformational thinking, transformational ways of living. One author says, obey God and leave the consequences up to him. You know, for Daniel, some days went well, other days not so much. But somehow, Daniel influenced his culture, and they did not influence him. I want you to fast forward. I know we're in July, but I want you to think about Christmas with me for just a moment. You go to the manger scene, and you've got baby Jesus and Joseph and Mary, and you have the shepherds. And a little while later, a group of guys show up, could be, could be as long as two years later, group called the Magi come to worship Jesus. Did you ever wonder how in the world did they know to be on the lookout for Jesus? In Daniel chapter 5 verse 11. Time for a new king. There is a man in your kingdom who has the spirit of the holy God in him. In the time of your father he was found to have insight and intelligence and wisdom like that of all the gods. Your father, King Nebuchadnezzar, appointed him chief of the magicians, the magi, the enchanters, astrologers, and diviners. How did the magi know how to be on the lookout for King Jesus? Even in exile, Daniel found a way to point the most broken pagan people on the planet to Jesus. How about that? I think of my last sermon, and it's one that I've just been marinating on a lot. I, I want to remind you to make 10,000-year decisions. One of my favorite songs is the song Amazing Grace. And in that verse where it says, when we've been there 10,000 years, right, shining as the sun. When you and I get to heaven and we see people who are there because of decisions we've made. 
On the 17th of this month, Susie and I celebrated our 40th wedding anniversary. Had all the kids home, all but one of our grandchildren were there. Susie asked me to do a children's lesson, and I did that, but I actually directed it more at my kids because I wanted to remind them of my legacy, my heritage. And at the end of the lesson, I handed a silver dollar to each one of the grandkids, some silver dollars that my Uncle Kip had left to me. You, you talk about a man of integrity. You, you talk about a man who made 10,000 years decisions. It was my Uncle Kip. And so I handed them each a silver dollar because I wanted them to know that I'm a Christ follower because of the impact that my Uncle Kip, a man of integrity, had made in my life. And just like Daniel made 10,000 year decisions, my Uncle Kip did that for me. And I want to encourage you to live a life of integrity, to live a life like Daniel and make those 10,000 year decisions. Let's pray. Father, I just thank you so much for your son, Jesus. And I thank you, God, that Daniel was willing to point people forward. And Father, I pray that we will live our lives in such a way that we point people to the cross. But even more than that, to the empty tomb and the resurrection. We love you, God. It's in Jesus' name we pray.